And one of the problems I think that immediately we got in, encountered was about language and definition and so on. And this whole idea about what did it, about digital placemaking and how you even speak about such a such a, a concept in a way that people begin to understand and get a, get a purchase on. So, Will, do you want to introduce that idea that 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 uh, issue for us about how how the language and the and the definition of this uh, term played out in your own work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like we had some incredible sessions right at the start of the of the Pathfinder where we were all kind of like throwing ideas and our understandings of digital placemaking and, and kind of like our experiences of our work and lived experiences uh, and kind of kind of like exploring how that influenced how we approached uh, the sense making process of the Pathfinder. Um, for me personally, it was I knew that I suppose, yeah, being a millennial that we have a great like relationship with like digital platforms and a vast majority of our lives exists uh, in digital ways, uh, so to speak. My, my thing was like my entry point was to try and understand how we could kind of like recreate that kind of sense of communal agency over digital spaces into the physical spaces of Bristol's cultural cultural institutions and organisations. Um, there's this sense of being able to be whoever you want to be online, which has its pros and its cons as individuals and as a community. Um, there is supposedly, supposedly more of a democracy online as well um, um yeah we all know how that's worked out recently but there the there kind of there's an element of that freedom that exists there that flagrantly and blatantly doesn't exist when people from marginalized communities enter spaces like museums and so on and so forth um and further further more to that as well access to those spaces as well different different communities have different priorities so they won't necessarily have the freedom or, or the amenities or the uh, expendable income to be able to go to a lot of these spaces albeit despite them being advertised mostly as free uh, they still uh, feel very physically inaccessible so when I was thinking about digital placemaking I was trying to understand how we can recreate that sense of pseudo-democracy so to speak uh, and my research has really influenced how I approach all of the language and the words around this work now. Um, but how we can like approach that democracy online and recreate in social in cultural spaces and try and play with the balance and the po uh, balance of power and the politics that occur in these spaces as well, such as like behavioral policing, uh, tone policing, uh, language, uh, linguistics, and all of, all of those things that kind of encourage our day-to-day -day habits, but we feel more often than not that they have to be policed when when sharing and taking up space in major, mainstream cultural spaces like galleries and museums. So how did some of those starting, uh, starting conversations begin to ripple out to the rest of the team, and especially about thinking about the way that the languages that we use either include or exclude certain kinds of participation in, in a co-design process? Just to relay that, you know, in, in doing a lot of the interviews and conversations that I've been um, uh, going through with this, with this research process, actually a lot of uh there's been a lot of resistance to that term um so i've really had to do quite a lot of work to unpick the conversations and the potentials of the conversations for the research um by just tackling that really kind of head on and i think what's really interesting is obviously in kind of explaining and re-explaining this term of digital placemaking um i can kind of see how my own understanding has shifted and, and, and changed and moulded along with these conversations because a lot of my work is about that, that deep listening with the people that you're working with. And so I think what I've noticed is that it's really, it's really obvious that we need to be really clear about what we don't mean about digital placemaking and what we don't think it is. So that's been a really helpful jumping off point. So thinking about um, digital placemaking interventions or initiatives or processes which actually centre people and communities and uh, a more grassroots kind of uh, approach to the process which has like people's genuine best interests and care at heart as opposed to flashy, fast, big 
corporate, uh, business focused, capital generating kind of processes. And I think that shift has been really interesting to see in my own language with how I use that, but also with those who I'm speaking about. When you start to speak about the potentialities of it, the real dreaming that we've been doing in that space about what it is, it's actually very exciting and people kind of start to yeah, get involved in that. That, that's a really good description, I think, of, of, of research in a way, Rosanna, you know, that actually your your own understanding and definition of a space begins to change through the dialogue and the things that you do and the resources that you reference and what you do in the process. So that's a really good thing to, to know that that's been happening for you. For me, the very first um, start of it when we thought about this was really investigating that when we're looking at something new like this, when we're even framing language, the concepts that we're using to actually give an edge to a concept and looking at what we're holding with it and we're figuring out where the edges are of that, where the borders are, what goes in and what goes out of that. I wanted to really look and investigate what we bring with us when we're creating or building or investigating or discovering something new because there are invisible privileges and default norms and oppressions and perpetuations of structural inequitable systems that come with us when we are in these new places and they impact what we create. And so for me, part of the, the big part of the language is who, who are the ones who are actually deciding these languages? Because historically, dominant cultures have approached exploration and development from, as we know, an incredibly violent place, from destroying and eradicating and enslaving and silencing and wounding the places and the people that they purported to be helping. So as creators and culture makers, we wanted to work in ways that are responsive and reflective and engaged. But, you know, for me, it was important that we're approaching this this very idea in the language from a way that's intersectional especially when we look at the idea of hybrid space one of the challenges with that is that it, it's looking at the uh, interaction the intersection between private and public but for many marginalized peoples uh, we haven't been able to have a separation between private and public because for example for many disabled people um, the idea that you know people in positions of power will you know for example the benefit system will absolutely want to know every single thing about you so for example from my personal experience I once had to justify to the housing benefit people everything I'd spent that cost over 50 pounds and whether it was a lived essential and chocolate was not a lived essential and I thought you know how do you justify that how do you have that moment and this happens so much through our lives and so really for me when we're coming into the discussion of language the question for me is not it doesn't begin at the language it begins as whose language is in our mouths i've been thinking a lot about this um as part of um writing up the research over the last month we ran an event um at the arnold Feeney in bristol earlier this year as part of the fellowship called um, designing digital cities and Jeff Rizm, one of the speakers from uh, GEL, a sort of placemaking architecture practice from Copenhagen, I remember him making the point that if you, if you ask citizens to describe their place, rarely do they use words like efficient. That language, that framing that you, you alluded to earlier, John, of the smart city is one that comes from business. And it's also one that comes from a sort of uh, language around austerity. It's around how can the smart city save money? How can it how can it optimise its performance? How can it ultimately take people and resources out in order to make those cities as efficient as possible? But when when you when you talk to people and ask them about their city, they talk about wanting good places to live. They talk about happiness. They talk about you know the quality of life that they hope um, for themselves and their families. So there's, I guess, a realization that the the smart city and all that goes with it has also stolen the language. It's sort of take it's taken the meaning and the and the opportunity away from what people feel is most important about their their, their lives and their place within the city. And I think part of what we need to do through this digital placemaking conversation is to help people to. Re- claim the language that means uh, something to them in their own local neighbourhoods. 